O oh God, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us now into your light that all our deeds may reflect your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Welcome back to our In Communion series, week three, entitled The Temple. I've been second-guessing myself all week about uh, trying to slam this much information into your brains this morning, but it's too late now. So here we go. I hope you have a blue handout in front of you. Uh, if not, just jump up, scream, wave, throw a shoe, um, and somebody will make sure you get hooked up with one of those. Uh, that'll help you kind of track with us because we've got a lot of information to punch through this morning. So you need a writing utensil, your blue sheet, and here we go. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned that I am a pastor's kid. And I thanked all of you on behalf of pastor's kids everywhere for canceling the Sunday night service, for finally getting rid of that thing that all of us pastor's kids could not stand. You see, the wonderful world of Disney started at 6 o'clock every Sunday night. And I'd get like three or four minutes into Herbie the, I always forget, Herbie the love bug. And then mom would come downstairs and say, okay, it's time to get in the car. We have to go to church. I would look at her, and I vividly remember every week saying, why? Why do I have to go to church? And let's be honest, that question is probably as old as church history itself. We would be kidding ourselves if little Johnny Hebrew boy, several thousand years ago, when his parents were loading up the donkey with a sacrifice and supplies to go to the temple, probably didn't look at his mom and dad and say, why do I have to go to the temple? What is the right answer? Why do we go to church? Why do we do this? What is it that we're involved in here? What is this thing called the church all about? Well, our text for this morning is Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, but we've got a ton of work to do before we can get to that text, and hopefully by the time we get there, that text will mean something, hopefully, more significantly than maybe it would if we just read it right now. So here we go. Can anyone tell me what this picture is of? I guess I've kind of given it away already. It is the temple. Yes, absolutely. This is the temple. In a couple minutes, uh, you'll figure out which particular temple that is, but uh, we'll get there in a second. You don't have to spend too much time in the Bible uh, before you realize that the temple is pretty significant to the people of God. It's pretty significant to the nation of Israel, which means that we would probably do well to figure out why the temple was so significant. Why did it matter so much to these people? So at the top of your blue handout, number one, the significance of the temple. That's where we're going to start. Now, uh, and the first question I'll ask is when we think about the significance of the temple is what are temples for? So that seems like a good place to start. What are temples for? Uh, How did the ancient nation of God, in fact, I would argue almost all ancient peoples, how did they view the temple? What did the temple mean to these ancient people? So letter A on your handout, the first thing we're going to talk about, the temple is a resting place for God. The temple is a resting place for God. Now, let's not get confused about the word resting, because I'll admit, when I hear the word resting, I think Sunday afternoon, Blue Jays game on TV, or you know, PGA golf, and falling asleep, because those things aren't entertaining enough to keep me awake. They just kind of lull me to sleep. Or I think, you know, a lot of excuse me, long weekend at the lake or cabin or time away, you know, away from responsibility. That's what I think when I think of the word rest. But that's not how ancients would have viewed this word. Ancients thought that rest is what happened when crisis had been resolved and then stability achieved. So when stability was achieved, then normal routine could begin. For example, when wars were finished being fought and land was settled, then people could rest, not nap, or sleep, but carry on the day-to-day routines of life. So rest for the ancient, in the ancient mind, was about the ability to carry out routine without crisis getting in the way. So for example, if we jump to Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 10, this is said to the nation of Israel. But you are about to cross the Jordan River and will settle in the land the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance. Then he will give you rest from all your enemies on every side so that... You live safely and securely. Resting meant that people could engage life without obstacles rather than what we think disengage life without responsibility. Is that making sense? Tracking with me so far, hopefully? Um, So with this understanding, 
Ancients would say we build a temple for God because, uh, because the temple is where God rests, which is to say that when crisis, travels, and wars are finally over, when stability has been achieved, then God will rest in his temple and oversee the day-to-day life of the nation. So on your handout, when stability has been achieved, God rests in his temple. When stability has been achieved, God rests in his temple. Are you with me so far? Resting. Let's keep this in mind as we keep moving along. The second thing we need to appreciate about the significance of the temple is this. On your handout, letter B, the temple is a dwelling place for God. The temple is a dwelling place for God. It's where God takes up residence to run the show and interact with his people. So right underneath that, on your handout, the temple is where God meets with his people. God meets with his people. It is where, in a very real and literal sense, God would meet with his people. God's dwelling place is in his house from where he ruled, practiced grace, forgave them, restored them, cleansed them, and literally talked with them. God is there. Sorry, uh, this is also why, uh, we got to get this point in, this is also why, as you will see in a moment, it's referred to as a holy place. The temple was referred to as a holy place because it is where God dwelt. God would interact with his creation from this place where he dwells. So, we've got resting, and now we've got dwelling. Next up, the third thing of significance concerning the temple is this. On your handout, letter C, the temple reflects creation. Everything in the temple was built to spec because God ordered it in such a way to reflect the heavens, to reflect the entire universe. So right underneath that, the temple is a copy and shadow of the universe. In fact, I didn't make that line up. It's just stolen right out of Hebrews uh, chapter 8 verse 5 where it's talking about what the priests did in the temple. And it says, they serve in a place that is a copy and shadow of the heavenly meeting tent, which is the universe. Everything about the temple experience, when you would walk into the temple, what the priests were wearing, what you would see on the walls, the things in which that you would participate and do and touch and smell and experience was all done to be a symbolic miniature representation of the entire cosmos. If I was an ancient Jew and I walked into the temple, I would know that I was walking into something that depicted the entire creation story. So we've got resting place. We've got dwelling place, and we've got creation reflection. Three essential components that if you were an ancient Jewish person, you would know that's what the temple was all about. So let's keep this in mind as we move along. Lots of information, so does everybody just take a deep breath? Take a big deep breath. Reach over, tickle your neighbor. Unless you find that really creepy, then perhaps just blow in their ear or, you know, nicely rest your hand on their knee. I'm sure that's fine. Nobody will. Maybe don't do that. That might not be good. Uh, Anyway, let's keep going. On your handout, number two. The temple was the focal point of every aspect of Jewish national life. It was the focal point of everything the Jewish people did. Everything. N.T. Wright, one of my favorite New Testament scholars, remarks that the temple's importance at every level of life can hardly be underestimated. The temple represented the people's religion, It was the symbol of their nation, and it represented the government and their laws. So it was kind of like the Mother Church, the Canadian flag, and Parliament Hill all wrapped up into one entity. That was the temple. And not only that, but if you remember, it had this symbolic miniature universe thing going on that whenever the temple was destroyed in the history of the nation of Israel, which we're going to talk about in a sec, whenever the temple was destroyed, it was as if the entire framework of the nation would fall apart. It was literally as if the universe fell apart and a wall would be erected between them and God. That's how significant this building was and the practices that went on in it to their relationship with God. So there you have a very basic understanding of what the temple meant to the people of God. It was God's resting place, God's dwelling place. It reflected the entire universe, and it was central to absolutely everything these people did. Are you with me so far? So far, so good? Now, let's quickly do a history of the tabernacle and the temple. And I mean quick. 
And hopefully, as we kind of trace this, this uh, historic timeline, you'll be able to see some of the attributes that we've just talked about, how this stuff actually mattered within the history of Israel. So on your handout, number three, the temple's historic timeline. So if you start in the garden, and you've got Adam and Eve doing their thing, and then sin enters the scene, and then right after that, we have the time that we call the patriarch. So you've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those guys and their families doing their thing. We would call that the patriarch, or the time of the patriarchs. And during this time, the nation of Israel is always on the move. They are quite literally a wandering people. So here's a question for you. Keeping in mind what we talked about before, about the significance of the temple, if you don't have a permanent address, can you have a temple? Think about what the word resting meant, day-to-day routine, normalcy of life. If you don't have a permanent address and you're constantly wandering, can you have a temple? What do you think? Hands up if you think the answer is no. Yes, you are right, those of you who are brave enough to raise your hand. On your handout, no stability means no temple. So during this time of the patriarchs, there is no temple. Uh, God just keeps kind of showing up in the chaos, in bushes, in pillars of fire, in random altars, but he does not have an established resting and dwelling place. Eventually, the nation of Israel puts together a tent, and they call it the tabernacle, which means the dwelling of Yahweh or the dwelling of God. But the resting place words, when you read about the tabernacle, the tabernacle are still not used. This is, believe it or not, they just dug this up a year ago. This is an actual fly-by photo of the tabernacle during that time. Some of you are going, really? Wow. That's incredible. I know, it's, it's fantastic, the little people and everything. Anyway, so the, the resting place language is still not used during this time. It, it is kind of like the dwelling of God, but it's still a tent. It's still got this ready-to-go-at-a-moment's-notice kind of thing. So things weren't established enough yet for the official temple, which means on your handout, letter B, this is the portable sanctuary. The portable sanctuary. Moses would go in there from time to time. This cloud of fire would descend on it. He'd have these wild conversations with God, which would, that he'd then go out and teach the people about this kind of thing. So there's this element of God dwelling there, but it's not established yet. It's not still the full temple deal. Eventually, then, we get to Solomon's temple. Uh, the people of Israel, during the time of King Saul, King David, and King Solomon, get established on their land. They finally fought some wars. There's relative peace now. And they are firmly established to the extent that they can now have an official temple where God will rest and run the day-to-day life of the nation of Israel. So David collects a whole bunch of materials. And, uh, and then Solomon gets the privilege of building, uh, building this. That's kind of a half-cut-out picture so you can kind of see inside the amount of gold that would have been in that place. Again, all of this stuff and the images reflecting the entire created universe. So it took the same kind of principle as the tabernacle tent, but then, then made it permanent and much bigger and certainly much nicer in the temple. This thing was built about a thousand years before the time of Jesus, give or take a few years. Now, unfortunately, this temple, uh, 500 years before the time of Jesus, gets completely destroyed. The Babylonians show up, they invade Israel, and down comes the temple. And the people are scattered all over the place into exile which gets us to the discussion of the second temple, what we would call the second temple era. So we don't have lots of info on this, but we do know that eventually, after the people were exiled, and remember, if you're in exile, it means you can't have a temple because there's no normalcy, there's no routine, there's no rest, people are scattered everywhere. But eventually, about 500 years before the time of Jesus, the people start coming back to the nation of Israel. And when they do, because the temple is so important, they rebuild the temple. And this is the second temple. Now, we don't really know much about it. We don't have a lot of literature that's been dug up to tell us about the second temple. But anyways, this gets us now to Herod's temple. So if we fast forward to about 20 years before the time of Jesus, we land in Jerusalem where the Roman Empire has swallowed up pretty much everything. And King Herod has been put in charge by the Roman Empire to run Jerusalem. And he takes it upon himself, even though he's not Jewish, to build Herod's temple, and he builds it on the foundation of what was the second temple. Much bigger, much nicer. We could spend like three hours talking about the craziness of Herod's temple and just the weirdness of this non-Jewish guy building a temple and why he would do such a thing, but hopefully someday we'll get to talk about that. Anyway, Herod's temple sits in Jerusalem. It starts being built about 20 years before the time of Christ, and right when Jesus is born, it's pretty much complete. And it would do its job for the nation of Israel until about 30 years after Jesus' death, 
when the Jews would revolt against the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire would decimate the temple, put it into rubble, and that is why we still to this day only have that one wall left in Jerusalem. That is what was left over of this uh, structure after uh, the Roman Empire destroyed it. So, even with all this information and all this historic stuff we've tried to cram into our brains, we still haven't answered the question regarding why this entire system was put in place. Why did any of this matter? Why was it set in motion? It's obvious, it's very obvious, that the temple was incredibly important to the nation of Israel. God rested there. He dwelt there. It, it was this picture of the entire universe. As we can see from, our, from the history of Israel, every time they were together, they had something like a temple in motion. They were taking part of that, part in that, but we still haven't figured out why did this all start. Why the temple system? Why was it important to Israel? And how did it all connect to the bigger reality of their relationship with God? So, deep breath again. Reach over, tickle your neighbor. Just a friendly, creepy little tickle. I don't see anybody's... Come on, where's the creepy tickles? Make sure everybody's with us. Okay. Now, flip your page. This, is for me, is where it gets very exciting. Day four. Number four at the top of your page... Or, sorry... Now I'm all confused. Number four, the top of your page, day seven. Day seven. Now hold on to everything we just talked about regarding what the temple represented, did, symbolized, and how God himself functioned within it. I know it's a lot, but try and hold it all in there. And let me ask you a question. If you were asked to read a very, very old, ancient document, like a really, really old document, do you think you'd be able to better understand the document if you knew something about the culture in which the document was written? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So keep in mind this ancient understanding of the temple, which we've just been talking about. And now listen to the words of a very ancient document entitled Genesis. And see if you can't hear something within these words that maybe you've never picked up on before. According to this poetic story, that which we're about to read, God has just finished putting all things in order. Days one through six of the creation story. God's just finished making humanity, man and woman, uniquely in his image. And he's made them to mediate between himself and his creation. And the ancient writer then says this about day seven. The heavens and the earth and all who live in them were completed. On the sixth day, God completed all the work he had done. And on the seventh day, God rested. God rested from all the work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all the work of creation. Now, what is going on here? What is the original writer of this document suggesting? What is the significance of these words? The chaos and instability of creation is over. God has completed his work, and now God rests. Now God declares creation, all of it, a holy place, and he rests within it. Have you ever wondered what happened on day eight? I mean, day one through seven seemed pretty phenomenal. What happened on day eight? I mean, did Adam and Eve kind of wake up on the eighth day and look at each other and go, man, this is kind of boring now. I mean, all that crazy stuff just happened last week, and now, now what's going on here? I mean, could it be that day seven is the beginning of life the way it's always meant to be? There's so many discussions about the importance of Sabbath in day seven. Maybe we've completely missed the point. Could it be that day seven is the beginning of life the way it was always meant to be? Creation, the chaos is over. Creation is put in order. God has now taken up his resting place in the entire created order, which means, what does resting mean? Running the day-to-day -day routine of life. God is now in his holy place where he dwells. That's what makes it holy because God is there in his temple. The temple is all of creation. God's resting there. He's running the show now that stability has come to creation. 
all of the sudden, day seven just got a whole lot more significant. Do you see it? Day eight and onwards was supposed to always look like day seven, a time of rest, stability, God in relationship with creation, running the show, interacting with his people, no veil of separation, the entire universe in an unadulterated relationship with its creator. Life the way it was always meant to be. I believe that Genesis 1 and 2 is is meant to look like an ancient temple inauguration manuscript. Now, if we had more time, we could get into this. It's just fascinating. If we all spoke Hebrew or even a bunch of other ancient languages, I could show you on the screen what a script for an ancient temple inauguration ceremony would look like. And if we held Genesis 1 right beside it, you would go, wow, it's the same thing with different words. What is the ancient writing, writer telling us? That all of creation was set in motion to be God's temple. It was where God would rest, dwell, and run the show. It was where people would meet with him. So on your handout, Genesis 1, the temple's inauguration. The temple's inauguration. But unfortunately, we always have to discuss Genesis 3. Sin enters the scene. And this temple of creation where God rests and dwelt is shattered. The way it was meant to always be is now distorted. But our God is a God of redemption in the mess. On your handout, our God is a God of redemption in the mess. And this is why the temple system was created. From the point of sin entering the scene throughout the Old Testament... The temple system is put in place to reconnect humanity with what was lost originally in the garden of Genesis 1 and 2. The temple was to bring God's people back to remind them of the way it was always meant to be. And now, hopefully, if I've done this any justice, this temple thing is starting to make a bit more sense. The temple is where God rests. It is where he dwells, and it is a constant reminder of the way things were always meant to be, an unadulterated universe that God would create where he would be in this unfiltered relationship with all of creation. Now, you could catch me after this this service if you want, and I could go on and on for hours. There are so many ridiculous, awesome parallels between the temple and and what happens there, and what we read about in the garden. Like, here's just one kind of fun thing. We're told in Scripture that the Garden of Eden was to the east. Well, the entryway to every single temple that was built was always from the east. It was like they were always trying to tell people, do you remember the way God made it? When you come here to meet with God, you are taking a step to remembering that and hopefully recreating it here and now. Anyway... Sorry, we could go on and on about that stuff. I I just find it fascinating. But all this brings us to Jesus. On your handout, number six, the significance of Jesus. The building, this temple system would never be enough. So Jesus became all the significance held in that building. He was the person in whom God fully dwelt. Jesus demonstrated for us the perfect human Humanity the way God meant it to be when he first created man and woman in the garden. That's who Jesus was. Jesus represents the perfect created order. He is a reflection of the way all things were meant to be. Jesus, Jesus is universal in scope. Colossians says all things consist in Jesus. And in Jesus, the battle was won. All things stabilized. The victory set in motion. This is why, standing beside the literal temple in Jerusalem, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. He was, of course, talking about himself. He was the temple. On your handout, Jesus, the temple in flesh. Everything that we've talked about, everything that was represented in that building is now true in the person of Jesus Christ. No longer would the temple system be needed to mediate between God and creation. And by entering into relationship with Jesus, 
we are then brought into relationship with God himself, the way things were always meant to be. Which brings us whew, to this morning's text. Now, that was a lot of background homework to get here, but I hope now when we read Ephesians 2, this will mean something far more significant to you. Hold on to everything we've talked about together. We catch up with the author of Ephesians 2, probably Paul. And he's writing to Gentile Christians who seem to be in a bit of a kerfuffle about whether or not they are saved like those Jewish Christians. So you've got non-Jewish Christians. They're talking with Paul. They're really confused. Are we in? Are we in like those Jewish Christians? Like, does this salvation thing work for us too? So using their stress and their confusion as the basis for his writing, Paul decides to teach them about salvation. So Ephesians 2 isn't so much about fixing a problem between Gentiles and Jews, though it did. It's about teaching these Gentiles what salvation is all about. And I think, I believe, subsequently teaching us what salvation is also all about. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 19. Try and keep everything that we've talked about going in your head as we read this. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We you, me, us, here, now, as followers of Jesus, as part of his church, we are the household of God. A building joined together referred to as a holy temple called the very dwelling place of God himself. On your handout, we, through Jesus, are the new temple. We are the product of Christ's death and resurrection. Jesus, the temple become flesh, makes us the new temple. Paul said this again in another spot in Corinthians. He said, don't you know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? We are the new temple. Think of all of that means. Think of that crazy thousands and thousands of year long historical timeline and trajectory of the temple. That is us. All of that encapsulated in us. On your handout, we are where God rests, where he runs the day-to-day routine of life. We are where God dwells. We are where God meets with creation, where he talks with creation, through which he reconciles creation. And we are to be a reflection of the way it was always meant to be. We are where God dwells. We are where God rests. And we are to be a reflection of the way it was always meant to be. The church, you and I, we are where God merges with creation. Where his purposes and mission are laid bare for the world to see and in which to participate. Our gathering here is not just a nice idea. It's not just something we dreamt up one day and said, hey, it'd be, great together. it'd be great to get together and sing some songs and pray and take an offering and listen to somebody talk for 40 minutes. No, 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 no. We here now are the resting place of God. We are the dwelling place of God, and we are to reflect the way it was always meant to be. When John concludes his letter entitled Revelation, which you will find as the bookend to our Bible, He's writing both the final chapters and the first chapters of this temple story, this temple trajectory. And he says this. I'll just read you a few lines from Revelation 21 and 22. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the former heaven and the former earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. We sang about that earlier. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Look, God's dwelling is here with humankind. He will dwell with them and they will be his peoples. I didn't see a temple in the city because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. This is the completion 
of the church's mission. And it is the first chapter in the new order of creation. This is the end of the temple story, but it is the beginning of a new creation wherein God is fully present. So, from the original garden to pillars of fire in the wilderness, to a tent called the tabernacle, to the temple itself, to the climax of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, to us, here, now, the church of Jesus Christ, to the final return of Jesus and the complete inauguration of the new kingdom, this is the story of the temple. This is our story. This is our story. I think it's worth missing a night at Disney for. We together here now have cosmic significance. Now, don't anybody get an idea about starting up Sunday night church again? That's, I'm trying to make a point, not push for Sunday night church. Anyway, when people come into contact with us, they ought to be experiencing the very presence of Jesus. When people come into contact with us, they ought to see, touch, taste, experience, and hear the new creation already in our midst, glimmers of what was in the garden and hope for what is in the future. They see it, they smell it, they hear it, they touch it, they taste it when they are with us, the church of Jesus Christ. Justice, love, mercy, grace, compassion, kindness, patience, redemption, and reconciliation. This is who we are because it is who Jesus is through us. The final thing on your handout, we are where the world touches Jesus. We here now are where the world touches Jesus. We are the temple. And so it is that we come to the communion table. It is here now where we celebrate and demonstrate that we are the resting place of God, that we are the dwelling place of God, and we are the new creation, putting things back to the way they were always meant to be. What we do now we do to demonstrate the reality of Jesus' presence with us here right now. So I'm going to invite those who have been asked to help serve this morning to come up, and you can grab your spots at the two tables here, and the band can come back up as well. The bread and the cup are going to be passed down your row, and we are attempting to pass the bread and the cup at the same time. So you'll have to do a little bit of juggling, and uh, that's okay. hope that's all right with everybody. I'm going to ask that you keep the bread and the cup until everyone has been served. And I'm going to come back up here in a second, and we're all going to partake together. And the servers, they didn't know that I was going to tell them this, but uh, this is for you guys as well. When you pass the bread to the next person, I'd like you to look them in the eye and say to them, Christ's body for you. And when you pass the cup to the person next to you, I would like you to say to them, Christ's blood for us. Christ's body for you, Christ's blood for us. The band's going to sing a, a new song to some of you uh, while this is passed. And if, uh, if you're looking for words to kind of contemplate or pray through in your mind, by all means, check out the words on the screen. Let me pray for us before we pass this out and continue. Actually, no, let's stop. We have to do something else first that I totally forgot. I'm getting carried away. I'm going to read to you the Aaron Gerard paraphrase version of Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, the version that I've rewritten specifically for Gateway Church this morning, so you're not going to find it on your phone if you go looking for it. I, I, I want these words to resonate with us this morning before we do this. Consequently, because of what Jesus has done, because of his body broken, and because of his blood shed. And the fact that we together now, as the church of Jesus, proclaim Jesus is Lord. We are now no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. We are built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, and now Christ Jesus himself as our chief cornerstone. In Jesus, this whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. This 
is who we are. And in him we are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is who we are. This is our story. And so we together proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ with us, Christ in us, and Christ will come again. Let me pray for us. O oh God, the risen Christ revealed himself to his disciples in the breaking of the bread. Feed us with the bread of life and break open our hearts that we may know him not only in the good news of what we hear in Scripture, but risen and right here, right now, in the midst of your people. Spirit of God, empower us to be your people. Empower us to be your temple. Guide us into truth. Encourage us. Teach us and speak to us, we pray. Jesus, we are humbled by our inclusion into your cosmic mission of redemption. I stand here now and say I cannot believe that I get to be a part of that. Lord, have mercy on us as we stumble along. Help us not to screw this thing up too much. God, we thank you for your grace. Open our eyes so that we might see you and in turn reflect you to a world that so desperately needs to know you. To a world that so desperately needs to come in contact with your church so that the world may know that our God lives and that this God is one of grace, love, mercy, compassion, and kindness. A God of redemption in the mess. Father, we celebrate this reality now as we partake in the bread and in the cup at your holy table. In Christ's name, amen.